ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the HCFAC hybrid meeting. We would like to remind everyone to silence their electronic devices. As a reminder, this meeting is being recorded. A quorum has been reached. I will now turn the meeting over to David Berenbaum. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, I think we all can agree that this has been a very meaningful and a very in-depth discussion uh, this morning and now for our afternoon session. Uh, for our members who are participating online, a request from the IT team, it does take them a moment to raise the volume on your microphone to participate with us in the room. So uh, just please give us about 15 seconds uh, once your camera is turned on before you start speaking, and that should cure some of the issues that we are experiencing this morning. We're actually getting to a session that I was really pleased was recommended for our discussion today with the members of the Housing Counseling Federal Advisory Committee. It's on how do we build the capacity to provide services to the Asian American Pan Pacific Islander community. As I noted earlier, uh, I think it's, we have so much room to build our capacity. 20,000 consumers assisted year to date in this fiscal year is nowhere near where we should be working with our partners, our wonderful housing counseling organizations, but also spreading the word now through what is a very targeted, what I'll describe as affirmative marketing campaign to reach diverse market <laughs> segments across the nation. And some of what we hear today, no doubt we can apply in future years of our awareness campaign. So we are more successful. And as I noted, building not only the capacity in this constituency, but for housing counseling nationwide. So uh, we have a, a wonderful group of panelists uh, for this particular uh, session. And I'd like to turn things over to Rosalind Epstein to kick us off. Thank you, Rosalind. Thank you, David. Thank you to the, uh, the committee. Um, so my name is Rosalind Epstein. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm the Director of Economic Empowerment at National Capacity, and I oversee our HUD housing counseling work. Um, and uh, today for this panel, I have the pleasure of introducing you to uh, three amazing folks who run HUD-approved housing counseling agencies in different parts of the state of California. Uh, Susanna Sneam from United Cambodian Communities, Christine Barker from Fresno Interdenominational Refugee Ministries, and Young Run Kim from the Korean Resource Center where the uh, committee met yesterday. And also joining us on the end is Zhu Kim, who uh, is from KRC and will be acting as an observer and an interpreter during the meeting. Um, I also am introducing you to Eric Johnson, who is from the California Housing Finance Agency, and will also be speaking a little bit about that program and um, the way that it's had a, a powerful impact in California. So. Before I turn it over to my panelists who have really some great things to share with you today, I just wanted to do a quick framing. Um, each of these agencies are in sort of different developmental stages of their housing counseling programs, and each of them have faced challenges to grow and develop their programs, um, and there's many commonalities between those kinds of challenges. Um, you know, I think we've heard a lot about the needs of monolingual clients, and uh, they're gonna speak really powerfully to the increased amount of staff time that it takes to serve those clients, um, and also really to, to meet them in a culturally as well as linguistically responsive way. They're also gonna touch on some of the technology needs of the communities that they serve. Um, and then they're also gonna mention the multilingual, multicultural housing counselors who are a vital link in the chain to provide those services. And, um, you know, the, the needs that we have for additional funding for our programs to really support those valuable skilled staff and to support their recruitment, their training, their certification, and their retention in our programs. Um, and then finally, I think they're also gonna mention a little bit about some of the challenges for staff who are not native English speakers taking the HUD certification exam and share some solutions that they have with you all today. Um, so I'm just going to ask a, a broad question and ask each of our panelists to respond about the communities that they serve and the needs that they see. Um, so first of all, I'd like to ask each of you to introduce yourself, your organization, and the community that you serve. 
um, and the needs that you see in that community, and then go on to talk a little bit about the, the stage in your housing counseling program is in currently, what are some of the challenges that you've experienced, and um, how have you overcome some of those challenges, what have been helpful supports, and what further supports do you need in order to continue to grow your housing counseling agencies? And I'm um, going to invite Susanna to begin. So everyone, uh, my name is Susanna Sniam. I go by she, her, hers, and I'm the executive director of United Cambodian Community that's based here in Long Beach, California. Uh, thank you so much for just taking the time to hear about the nuances and needs within each of our communities. And I'd like to share more about the Cambodian community and um, also just my story too. Uh, so I was born and raised here in Long Beach and my family actually came here in 1981 as Cambodian refugees and were sponsored by family in Kansas City. They lived there for about three months and it was too cold. So we moved here to Southern California, which is a very similar story to a lot of our uh, Cambodian families. Uh, back in 1970, there was a small group of Cambodian students studying here at Cal State Long Beach and Cal State LA, and they already established a Cambodian community. And so when the Khmer Rouge happened from 1975 through 1979, in which the Cambodian community experienced over two million people um, put to death or dying uh, due to genocide. Because of that, there was a huge influx of Cambodian refugees coming here to the States and, uh, and were sponsored by families. And Long Beach became a destination because there was already a Cambodian community, Cambodian resources that were located in Long Beach. So if you don't know, Long Beach has the largest Cambodian population in the nation. And we want to continue to serve and provide culturally relevant services to the Cambodian community. What we see in the Cambodian community is that our community members have moved into an area called Cambodia Town, and it's located in central Long Beach. And this neighborhood is historically red line, in which um, a lot of our community members were able to afford to live in this area. And as you know, with a lot of red line communities, they are the highest, um, ha in terms of the highest um, rates of uh, poverty and also crime. And, um, but that's the areas that our community members are able to afford and move into. What we see in the Cambodian community is that 75% of the Cambodian community is our renters and only 25% own homes. And when you actually break it down in the city of Long Beach, the Cambodian community along with single black African American mothers are the highest wet burden in our city. In addition to that, what we see with our older adults, because they are monolingual speaking, but also they have a lot of mental health conditions due to trauma from genocide, uh, they need additional support. And within the Cambodian community, when it comes to older adults, a lot of times it's tasked for the children to take care of their older, their parents. Um, and what you're seeing is that a lot of these young, these children that are adults are choosing to move outside of Long Beach because of the rising rents, but also they're able to afford homes outside of our city. Um, and so they try to move in their older adult um, parent into their home, but then the parent uh, feels isolated because in these other cities, there's no other Cambodian resources like a Cambodian grocery store or the Buddhist temples. And so they choose to still stay in Long Beach and, and live apart from their family members, which means that they have a very small income, fixed income, and are not able to afford to live on, our, on their own. Um, and so what we try to do is really support our older adults in gaining access to affordable housing. Um, and so because of these needs, UCC, we're a 45-year-old organization, and about seven years ago, we did a community needs assessment, and we saw that our community members are still um, dealing with high effects around health, but also the built environment and around housing. And there was no Cambodian agency that was providing services around economic development and community development. So that's when UCC started building our capacity to enter into this space. Um, and that's when we started working with National Capacity to become a HUD certified housing counseling agency. Uh, that was five years ago. We are still in the process of becoming a HUD certified counseling agency because of some of the barriers that we ran into in building the capacity capacity of, of uh, being able to identify bilingual and bicultural community members that have the cultural skills and expertise, but also have the technical expertise of a housing counseling, uh, HUD certified housing counselor. 
So what that looks like for UCC is that now I have two staff members, uh, uh, one that is more, um, more of the uh, cultural expert and is bilingual in Khmer and English. And then I have another staff member who is part-time who has more of the technical expertise. And I decided to do it this way because then they can collaborate and work with one another. Um, but I'm not able to afford a full-time right, housing counselor. So uh, our housing counselor, who her first uh, language is English, she it took her three times to pass the exam. And she also has been certified in uh, real estate in two, in two states. And it took her three times to pass the housing counseling exam. And she uh, is a strong English speaker. So that says a lot for the exam itself um, in which our, our, our monolingual or our bilingual staff is, it's a much challenge, bigger challenge for them to um, pass the exam itself. So uh, what I would recommend in terms of being able to invest in communities moving forward to have the capacity to best serve in a culturally relevant housing counseling services is to um, invest in capacity building dollars for community-based organizations like United Can Build a Community. What that means and looks like is that uh, for the HUD exam, um, being able to allocate dollars for training. One of the things that we run into, because we're not HUD certified, is that a lot of the training grants that are offered, we're not eligible for. Um, and so we have to look at other private foundation grants in order to train our <coughs> HUD certified housing counselors to get certified. And then um, when they get certified, that process itself is uh, very expensive. You know, you retake the exam, it's $100 per exam, right? And so so uh, if we can, one suggestion from our counselor is to extend the time for those that are uh, bilingual. Um, more than an hour, I would say at least double the time uh, so that they're able to really look through the questions and best understand the questions and answers. Um, the exam itself is very comprehensive, which is great, but I also would recommend breaking out the exam into different sections. And if you fail one section, that you only have to retake that section itself. Um, because of how comprehensive it is, it takes a lot of studying. And, um, and so I would recommend breaking out the sections so that uh, our housing counselors are able to focus on the sections, sections that, they are not, um, that they did not pass. And then um, in addition to that, I would also recommend fully funding housing counseling. Uh, I really appreciate it that you shared that housing counselors are very valuable and needed and important. So put money behind that, right? And what do I mean by that is that I'm gonna share a specific example in which I was speaking with a partner agency here in LA County. And LA County had an amazing program in which they were going to allocate uh, $20,000 for uh, down payment assistance. And so this agency has the technical side of the uh, managing the program in which of being able to allocate these dollars. So they approached UCC because they know that we have the cultural expertise and that connection to our community members and asked if we want to partner with them. Um, and so we were very interested because it's something that's needed in our community. Um, and then they shared with us their budget. So out of their $300,000 budget, they allocated 23,000 to direct services. That's 7% of their budget going to direct services. Um, and for me, I was just, uh, just uh, very astonished at that, uh, uh, that approach. And so for me, it, they, they didn't understand the scale of work that will be serving our Cambodian community. Um, many folks have shared that it takes a lot of trust building and, and a lot more work beyond just the housing counseling 101 that is shared um, and i want to break that down what that means uh, for us it's three parts the first part is being able to build that trust and what that means is that um, providing services to them including benefits enrollment uh, and following through on those enrollments uh, because once they see that we are able to provide these services and see that direct um, impact on them, then they're willing to invest more time and support. Uh, the second part is education, really breaking down uh, about rental, um, 
about rental rights, all those things, and having them understand why it's important to have a housing counselor. And the third part, that's the enrollment, the actual housing counseling one-on-one -on -one services that we provide. So for us, it takes at least three times as much work uh, to provide housing counseling services to our community members. So I would definitely recommend being able to provide guidelines on how funding allocation looks like within housing counseling, being able to uh, allocate direct dollars into housing counselors, and encouraging agencies to work with community-based organizations that have the cultural expertise to work within hard-to-reach populations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much, Susanna. Um, and now I'm going to ask Christine to speak. Good. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Christine Barker, and I am the executive director of FIRM in Fresno, Fresno Interdenominational Refugee Ministries. Fresno is in the center of the Central Valley of California, close to Yosemite uh, and Sequoia National Park. And 13, 15 years ago, uh, we were really at the heart of the foreclosure crisis that, that gripped our entire nation. And um, and Fresno also has a lot of historic concentrated poverty, uh, and it's it's also a historic welcoming place for immigrant and refugees from all around the world, especially folks from rural uh, areas. And so Fresno is home to one of the largest Hmong American communities in. Uh, the U.S., former U.S. allies in uh, the secret war of Laos, as well as a large Laotian community, Cambodian community, uh, and um, smaller but growing uh, Burmese, Thai, and Vietnamese as these communities are getting priced out of the Bay Area and Los Angeles. Uh, so firm has been working with Southeast Asian and other refugee communities for almost 30 years. And we actually bought our building uh, because some tenants of a, an apartment complex called Somerset organized and invited us to be their partner and to become the Somerset Community Center almost 20 years ago. And so we have been working with low income, limited English proficiency tenants for almost as long as we've been around, but we only became a HUD certified housing counseling agency in 2019. And that was after a lot of work and a lot of learning and a lot of partnership uh, with National Capacity and our amazing program manager now, Pai Ying Her, I like to point her out when she's in the audience, she, uh, and the former executive director. Uh, and um, it's, uh, and even once we became certified, it was a huge learning curve to stay certified and to make sure that we could get our staff certified before that August deadline um, while a pandemic was raging. So we became certified in December of 2019. I became executive director March 11th of 2020, and all of our uh, communities were told to stay home due to their vulnerabilities on March 15th of 2020. And so... Um, as we were discussing this panel, we were talking about how, how have we built our capacity? How have we stayed uh, certified? And a big part of that was that we were able to, through national capacity, get CalHFA uh, funding to um, provide housing counseling services. And part of that was capacity building dollars. So we got to pay people for six months to study for this test, to take time away from helping clients and sit together, go through the online modules, talk about what it means, try to go to every single training there was. And still, it was literally the day of the deadline and, one of our, and none of our staff had passed. And they'd taken it time and time and time again um, for, uh, and these are all the online version and so, um, if any of them were confused by a question and they were like just mouthing the words to understand the question, the, the, the people would break in and say like, don't move your lips, you can't talk, this is, a, 
this is an observed exam. And so they'd be like, mm. and so it's just like a very stressful experience that's not at all conducive to folks who speak English as a second language or third or fourth, <laughs> um, uh, like many of the staff at firm. And so uh, we are very proud that we currently have three HUD certified housing counselors on staff. I believe we're the only housing counseling agency that offers services in Hmong and Lao on the entire West Coast. Um, and probably, I don't know if there's any in Michigan, but if there are uh, Wisconsin, but, or Minnesota, but if they're not on the West Coast, um, they're gonna be over there. And um, I think capacity building is a huge need and also recognizing it, when we're doing housing counseling, it's not just having a conversation about a budget, it's also helping people navigate all these other systems in order to access resources. Because if resources aren't available in the language that people speak, they might as well not exist. Um, so all of these beautiful COVID funds, um, our housing counselors have had to do a lot of work to help um, refugee and immigrant community members access those resources um, at this and in the way that they should have equal access to everyone else, right? They're equally eligible, um, but without housing counselors who speak their language, they don't have access. Um, and I'll stop there. Thanks for your time. <laughs> Thank you very much, Christine. And um, now I'm gonna call on Young Ren Kin. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Youngnan Kim, and I am the Operation and Housing Program Director at the Korean Resource Center. Uh, KIC was founded in 1983 to empower Korean and Asian American and low-income and immigrants communities through social service, education, culture, organizing, and advocacy. KIC has been running a housing counseling program as a HUD certified housing counseling agency since 2008. Based on that experience, I would like to talk about the housing situation and issues in the LA area where the largest number of Korean immigrants lives in the United States. The official Korean population in the United States was 2.63 million as of 2021, of which 54% were born in Korea and 46% were born in, in the United States. California is a home of 557,000 Koreans, including those of mixed races. Uh, about half of foreign-born Koreans have difficulty um, speaking English. Over the past decade, the Korean community in Los Angeles has made significant progress economically and politically when compared to other community, communities. Much of this can be attributed to the rise in popular, popularity of Korean culture, like K-pop music, Korean food, and K-beauty. You can see the economic progress throughout K-Town in the rapid development in large commercial space, spaces and political progress in the increase in Korean-American voters and voter turnout. However, with this remarkable growth, it is important to diagnose and respond to the effects crisis that gentrification is having on the already dire housing crisis. According to the neighborhood change index. In the top 10 most gentrified neighborhoods in LA, which include downtown LA, Chinatown, Hollywood, and Koreatown, we see that low-income and middle-income people of color and immigrants suffer the most. As luxury apartment and high-rise buildings were built in Koreatown, population density increased, and the gap between the rich and the poor and traffic congestion deepened. First and foremost, skyrocketing rents are putting the middle class at risk of being forced to the reloc relocate to other neighborhoods. The average rent for one bedroom in Koreatown is $2,200, which has risen, risen by more than $800 in 10 years, 50%, a 57% increase. <laughs> According to our rent, I mean, according to a recent Moody's analytic report, 
LA's average rent to income ratio is 35.6%. 35 Most of our client data has over 50% RTI. Soaring rents are inevitably linked to the eviction and homelessness crisis. And in a full county at about 70,000, oh, I'm sorry, the, a full count conducted in September 2022, the number of homeless people in LA County was counted at about 70,000. But the actual increase in homelessness is predicted to be greater than this. We are seeing that the homeless situation has become more intensi intensified during the pandemic. Until a few years ago, there were very few Korean clients who came to counseling for the homelessness issues, but these inquiries from clients living in their car without a home or looking for a temporary homeless shelters are increasing these days. So what can we do, what can we do about this situation? Some neighborhood residents and social activists are active in the anti-gentrification movement, and there are non-profit organizations that are collecting signatures for rent control initiative. Homelessness is a complex issue with no easy solutions. We believe that providing safe, affordable housing is an important step to help those who are struggling. In the community, there is a voice that the government should support newly built apartments to increase the number of affordable units allocated by policy, and to complete the project to create facilities that provide job training along with the emergency housing by renovating motels or old apartments. We have to pay attention constantly. KRC also officially supported to the construction of a homeless shelter in Koreatown in 2018 and campaigned for a, a roof for everyone. More diverse ideas and policies should be supported, but we must not forget the strength and solidarity with communities of different ethnicities is important. From the point of view of housing counseling, the largest trend in the past six months has been the increase in rental assistance requests. The COVID-19 eviction moratorium ended on March 31st, 2023, resulting in tenants beginning to receive eviction notices. There has been a dramatic increase in community members seeking information on their tenants' rights as well as information about affordable housing options. KIC provides rental and financial counseling and workshop. Our three HUD certified counselors consisting of staff and volunteers work to help low-income families and seniors build economic capacity and create more comfortable rental housing environment. The program is operated through a HUD grant, and over the past two years, the KLHFA program has provided housing counseling to more than 700 clients on affordable housing application, rental assistance application, eviction prevention, and tenant rights. We also provide various social services such as public assistance, health, and transportation support through our staff and volunteers. There are many success stories through housing counseling program, but time is running out. So there was a case in which, uh, a recent case, which a 75 years old client who was at risk of a forced eviction due to a remodeling uh, received free support for a safe residential space for a one year through a legal firm affiliated with our organization. In addition, we helped 200 low-income families with a limited English proficiency apply for the Los Angeles Section 8 voucher waiting list lottery, and 36 of them were selected. Um, there were Total of 30,000 City of LA Section 8 housing voucher choices, choice 
opened from last October, and over 400,000 applicants applied. There are 6,300 units of public housing supported by the city of LA and a number of tax credit apartments, but supply is severely short of demand. In order to reduce the waiting period and waiting list congestion, information sharing through cooperation with the housing authorities of the city and county and transparency of affordable apartment waiting list are urgently needed. At the same time, challenges remain to seek an environment through tenant education and organizing to afford legitimate rights and protect neighbors in need. As mentioned earlier, KRC has been running house, housing counseling programs for more than 15 years uh, as an agency of HALT since 2008. Unfortunately, our organization underwent, underwent a huge transition in 2019 and was about to discontinue our housing program as we downsized. That what was able to overcome the crisis was the foundation of a grassroots movement to become the lowest threshold of the community, the dedication of numerous volunteers, and the support of a national capacity on intermediary who lead us without giving, giving up on us. Despite the lack of affordable housing and difficulties in find, finding housing counselors who can speak Korean, we will do our best to continue expanding our housing counseling program. So thank you for the listening to my presentation and I look forward to your continued interest and support. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yangren. And uh, now I'd like to invite Eric to speak a little bit about the Cal HFA program. What is the back end ratio for a client with a monthly housing expense of $1,250, a monthly total of $88 in other consumer debt payments, and a gross household income of $4,460 per month, rounded to the nearest whole percent? Anyone? <laughs> I think I know. <laughs> I'm just making the point that these, the test questions are really hard in English. And think about trying to approach that if that's not your first language. I was a math major. That's a hard question. Uh, and a, a, maybe a better question would be, Mary shows up at your office distraught and tells you that she's got, just got an eviction notice on her front, your front uh, door. Her child has gone without eating for the, the past day. What's the first thing you say? It seems like so much of the counseling industry and people wanting to come into a counselor is known as a human on the other side of the screen, on the other side of the desk, who is going to be able to talk to you and hear your problems, not get out with a calculator and try to figure out your back end ratios. Uh, my name's Eric Johnson. I'm in marketing for the California Housing Finance Agency. We're currently administering the National Mortgage Settlement Counseling Program. Uh, we received about $300 million through the National Mortgage Settlement uh, from the Great Recession back in the day. And we are using, so far we've used about $100 million of it. We just extended the program out to December 2025. We have about 75 of the about 82 HUD certified counseling agencies under our umbrella participating in this program in California. We have three intermediaries, Unidos, Balance, and Home Free, who are kind of our umbrella organizations over these, uh, these agencies. And um, as two folks have already said today, uh, the program has really made a difference for a lot of folks. And I think one of the biggest things that made the difference, and I've heard this from a lot of the uh, council agencies that we've talked to, is that the funds have very few strings attached to them. Uh, the basic program is we will pay $750 for a counseling session, and then an additional uh, 750 if it goes to what's called, called tier two, if the person or family has major issues that just can't be resolved in a short time. So uh, any client can uh, receive up to $1,500 in counseling services. The HCA gets, can get a maximum of $1,500. We also had a legal services aspect to it, but as it turned out, uh, the legal services aspect, which you'd think with foreclosures and landlord issues would be very well used, 
the counseling agencies just, just can't find lawyers to refer people to because all their lawyers are already so impacted and so slammed that they, that they just can't do it. Uh, what I think really made the difference for folks is the capacity building aspect of the program. We allocated uh, several million dollars specifically for capacity building because even if we are paying agencies $1,500 per client, uh, when that money goes away, those services stop. What's really important is to be able to help the agencies, you know, give people time to study for the test so they can make their way through the labyrinth. It takes like eight clicks to get to the test. You can't even look at a sample test until you, all, until you register. That's a problem. I mean, how am I supposed to decide if I want to do this if I have to register and put in my name and account and other information before I even get to a sample test? Uh, and the idea that counselors and counseling agencies, what we found is they're geniuses. We have put together, we spent a, you know, about $50,000, $75,000 so far on marketing social media, um, Google ads, a targeted email campaign to, to get to people. But what really makes a difference is when we can give money to the counseling agencies and let them do it. They know what's gonna work. They know that a pop-up at the farmer's market is gonna attract 50 farm workers. They know that uh, putting an ad on a bus in this particular neighborhood on this particular route, that's the one that goes by the black churches at 11.30 when they're getting out of church. So they know when everything is gonna happen. Um, we also found that the disaggregation of data is so important. Uh, I, I wish I could emphasize it more than saying it's the most important thing, but I can't. And if, I think if you take one thing away from your, your visit here in Los Angeles, and I think it's already sunk in, is that um, you know, the Asian American community is, is not anywhere close to monolithic. It's not trilithic, it's not quadrilithic, it's not decalithic. It's got dozens and dozens of subgroups in there. They all need different things at different times. And the agencies that are on the ground doing the work are really the ones who know best. Uh, it took me a while working for a state agency to realize that we don't know what's best for everyone, but really working through this program and hearing the stories and the successes and the challenges that, uh, that the firms and the Korean Resource Centers and the Cambodian community are, are facing, the people on the ground know best. And we really need to be able to give them the flexibility to spend the funds where they need it most. Having a lot of uh, rules and regulations and boxes, and this is an approved expense, this is not an approved expense. One of the things we did, we, we gave people Wi-Fi vouchers. We talked about Wi-Fi earlier, and here's a $35 voucher towards your Wi-Fi. Uh, we paid for bus passes so people could go visit their counselors, and that's something that only the agencies are gonna know what works for their zip code, for their radius. Um, there's, there's so much good work to be done. I really think that this counseling program is the best thing we're doing as a state agency right now in terms of the maximum number of people we're helping who need the help the most. And $750 can mean the difference between you know, having a roof overhead or being in your car with your kid. Uh, there's the stories of being in the car with a kid and they talked to one of our counselors, figured out how to get a job, how to apply, and now they're in an apartment. That's the kind of thing that makes me shiver. And I hope that being on this committee and all the stories you hear and the work you do, I hope you have lots and lots of opportunities for shivers. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, thank you. Let's thank our panel. And I'd also just like to highlight that we do have uh, several counselors who are also in the room from some of these agencies that are not on the panel. I know um, we have a counselor from FIRM uh, and we have several counselors from UCC, I believe. So just wanna thank them, there you are. I just wanna thank them for all the work that they're doing as well. Um, I think I'd like to pass it back to David now for some awesome. questions. Th thank you so much. And to each of our panelists, thank you for your observations and recommendations. Uh, I'd like to, Susanna, if I may, react to something you said. Uh, two years ago, in conversation with National Capacity, the Office of Housing Counseling made a commitment 
to offer our certification exam in additional languages. We are very close to making that announcement. We're in negotiation with our contract agency, and it's coming down to just simply the number of new translations that can occur with our funding. Uh, but I think that uh, in particular with the communities that you serve, you will be very pleased with the announcement when it takes place. Uh, I understand and we acknowledge that the certification exam is very challenging. Uh, that is a given. But I will also say we are also extremely, extremely pleased with the reception in industry and across the country with what certification is bringing as far as respect for the profession of housing counseling. Uh, we have over 6,000 individuals who have passed the exam and currently approximately 4,150 who are employed by housing counseling agencies. And of course, you can pass the exam, but if you're not a current employee, you are not a HUD certified housing counselor. But we look forward to that number growing and your points about the importance of being able to navigate the exam. We are always open to suggestions and uh, all of the HUD staff in the room. And if I may for a moment, uh, I want to acknowledge the HUD staff. Could the Office of Housing Counseling staff just stand up for a moment, please? Just stand, don't be shy. There we go. Thank you folks for all your good works. But please feel free also to speak with them about your suggestions about the exam because we do update the exam regularly. A uh, forthcoming update will be incorporating, for example, appraisal very appropriately with the attention that is being placed on the issue. Uh, I also, uh, I had the pleasure of speaking with Eric last night over dinner. I wanna repeat what I said to him because I genuinely have really believed that in the state of California, we actually have the strongest HFA in the nation as far as a model program for how it supports and funds housing counseling. And part of that success is what we heard today. It's clearly the program is a role model for what we wish other states would be doing. And we look forward to having even a closer relationship with the State Housing Finance Agency following up on this meeting today. Um, I'd like to invite the members of the committee to jump in. Once again, uh, bear with me, I'd like to go to the members of the committee who are participating via the web. Uh, and why don't we see, uh, is, are all of the members currently available right now? They are, thank you very much. So uh, why don't I start with Carol Dejanovich uh, once, if she's available. For all of the insight, um, I learned an awful lot this morning, this afternoon from this panel. Thank you for all that you do as well. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to remind uh, our members participating via uh, Zoom that you have to give our team a few seconds to turn the microphones on. So uh, please wait until perhaps uh, I get a thumbs up from uh, the team. Uh, very good. Uh, Carol, could you repeat what you just said? I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead, Carol. Okay, what I just wanted to say was uh, thank you for the panel this afternoon. I've learned an awful lot and um, wanted to say thank you so much for all the work that you do to help our job be a little easier, so thank you. Thank you, Carol. Uh, why don't we turn next uh, to Bill Sevilla, if he's available. Um, most of my counseling time, I've focused on first time home buyers, uh, foreclosure prevention, and, and I've learned today that there's a segment of our community, the elderly, that keeps growing because medication and medicine have advanced the lifespan for all of us. And this is a growing number that maybe needs to be given more focus. Probably a, a report should come out on where are folks going to live when they stop working and have to rely on their social security. Do we have the housing to accommodate this growing population because it isn't going to get less it is going to grow. And I'm one of those elderly, I, I'm still working, 
and enjoying what I do. But someday I may stop working and I need to figure out <laughs> what's available. And, and today has brought that clearly into focus for me. And I value what HUD can do in terms of the analytics that might come out and gathering information from the different uh, communities that you serve. So that would be my focus. And I will take a deeper look into Florida where I work to see what is going on in my state that needs attention. Is it properly being addressed or is it like many communities, perhaps not getting the attention it gets, it's not important or it's sort of uh, been left behind because other issues are more important. So that's what I've learned today. And I'm so appreciative of the opportunity of be, to have heard everybody speak. I thank you. Thank you, Bill. And why don't we turn to Marshall Lewis. Listening to the information that was being shared, how um, I work very closely with the continuum of care um, and then I am in the rental industry. And now I sit on this advisory committee to help people become homeowners. And I was just thinking as you were talking about as people come in and you have to uh, talk with them, you know, you may be talking to people who, you know, are worried about having something to eat or um, the renters who, you know, were impacted after the moratorium ended who now are possibly homeless. And I was just thinking about how we have, you know, as we as we work to try to, to um, enhance what we're doing in each of these areas, we, we've got to some kind of way be talking more. And I know it's not something necessarily that, you know, that the Office of Housing Counseling can, can do, but, you know, we as practitioners, you know, can connect more with the other people who are helping to serve the clients that we are trying to move through this continuum. Um, and, you know, I was thinking also how it's, it's all proportional. I was listening to the numbers of, you know, vouchers and money. And of course I was relating that to numbers and it's all, you know, it's all relative. Um, if we can impact one family, that's one family who will possibly be able to say that they now own their home and they have investment and they have land that is of value that, that they didn't have before. And that's one more than yesterday. So it, I was just thinking about those things. Thank you, Marcia. Thank you very much. And let's turn now to Richard Virilio. Hello, Richard. We can, can you hear guys. Yep. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. No, I just like to um, say with with the Cal program that is the model that is the the best that I've seen for housing counseling when it comes to accessibility. When it comes to funding, um, they make it straightforward. They make it. Uh, easy for counseling agencies to utilize it. And it's definitely something that I think other states and other programs should really follow. I think they really hit it on the head with that program. Great. Th thank you for sharing that. Uh, let's uh, go around the room a little bit. Um, anyone like to jump in? Please, Paul. Thank you, David. Um, I do have a question based upon Susanna's comments. So thank you for them. Um, the, Susanna raised the question about having housing people taking the exam only repeating that portion of the exam for which they were not successful. Is that something that is possible or is that something that is prohibited? Uh, the Office of Housing Counseling can orchestrate how the exam is offered. I will note, however, that changing the model of the exam would imply a significant cost to the program, and that may be a challenge. However, we're open to suggestions, and it's something we can look at. 
Hmm. And then I, I, I had a, a, if I may, I, I had a, a question for Eric. Um, you mentioned, um, and I, I didn't get the whole uh, picture regarding uh, the issue with legal. Um, in, in, in Massachusetts, um, the Attorney General's office has an office Call, a service called Home Corps, and their specific program is to work with uh, citizens and um, others who are having difficulty negotiating uh, solutions to problems with lenders. And I didn't know if that's part of what the issue is, or is it? Um, is there some other issue associated l with the legal aspect? As I, under, as I understood it from the people I've spoken to, it's that the lawyers who work in that space already have so much, I hesitate to call it business, but they already have so many clients that referrals from this program are like way back at the back of an already existing very, very long queue. There's not enough, there's not enough lawyers to deal with all the, the legal stuff that, that needs to be taken care of. So the people who are going in the direct have priority over referrals from our program, so the there isn't the counseling agencies just don't even bother. Thank you. And I'd also like to add that uh, for the AA and NHPI communities, these lawyers also would then need to have language ability, so that further reduces the number of lawyers who could be of service. I just want to respond to the point about professional development, in particular onboarding and training of, I'll describe it as the next generation of housing counselors. Um, there are a number of different models that have been established across the country by housing counseling organizations, from mentorship to incentive-based. Uh, obviously, I think that everyone is aware of some of the training programs that are offered by our own HUD-approved agencies and HUD-funded groups, as well as the private sector at large. And they're all very commendable. But I'm very excited by some of our initial work through our uh, HBCU and Minority Serving Institution Partnership Initiative. It's our grant program, of course. Uh, we have 16 funded organizations, including intermediaries, uh, HFA, and local counseling organizations. They are currently partnering with 50 HBCUs and MSIs nationwide. I really hope that we can see substantial growth in the next round of funding, our next NOFO, to continue to expand partnerships between organizations that serve the AAPI community and, in fact, colleges where, in fact, we can offer programs that not only benefit the college community, traditional housing counseling, home ownership education, landlord-tenant rights, and that includes also faculty, alumni, and residents in surrounding communities. But I'm very excited by the professional development courses that are emerging, where, in fact, we see our agencies now beginning to really program educational courses and where even some of our agencies thought they were uh, creating a, a channel to lead to the mortgage industry or the real estate industry for employment, students are saying they would like to become HUD certified housing counselors. How can we do this? And so I invite you to speak with Jerry Mayer and our team because we'd like to see that side of the equation grow. And we are very supportive of efforts that will bring counselors pre-hire into these training programs so they can come on board fully certified. So I just wanted to share that thought with you. It's an area of opportunity for growth for all of us in building our capacity. Anyone else? Please. Um, <coughs> I think that uh, in New York, a lot of the housing counseling agencies, what we consider one of their- a little bit closer to sorry. the right? One of the things we consider the greatest strengths of the housing counseling agencies in New York is their ability to connect um, their constituencies to available resources and their resources that most people are unaware of and they are kind of the repository and um, have access to all that information and uh, you know it seems like a lot of your groups have expanded beyond the resources available just for housing and looking at resources available for employment and benefits uh, etc which makes sense because it's all interconnected 
interconnected in terms of what people can afford. And if you have resources to help with your medication or your food, then you have more money to spend on housing and, and that kind of stuff. Um, so I think it would be, um, you know, obviously funding seems to be a big concern or issue. So, um, you know, it feels like the data that everybody keeps talking about, um, to be able to um, put out data showing the efficacy or the impact of housing counseling is something that could ultimately be presented to the mortgage lending community and servicers um, with a value so that there is some type of trade off with the industry where we would rather pay for um, housing counseling up front and pay 40% less for foreclosures on the back end or different things like that so that there's an additional way to get resources. But also, especially with your particular constituencies, it seems like citizenship is also an issue and, and um, feeling like you have um, a possibility of having your voice heard or the ability to have an impact. So, you know, advocacy is a huge thing in terms of trying to raise awareness and get people involved and let them feel um, part of the, the process. Um, because, you know, obviously, if they're not voting, then they're not getting um, the attention of the representative representatives. And it's already, they're already gerrymandered out of <laughs> their voices as much as um, can be possible in a lot of places. So it's that much more important to make up for it. So I'm curious what roles you think that we could play in terms of supporting um, that side of things, um, getting the data that you need in order to be able to make your case to the, the mortgage lenders out there for funding, um, and even private foundations and things, as well as um, the advocacy education for participation in democracy and that kind of stuff. Would anyone like to respond? Um, I'll, I'll give comment on the second part of your question because that's a huge piece to UCC's work is also building the capacity of our community members to be engaged in uh, community development and planning, right? Because it is how our cities are set up and the built environment that affects our community members' health and our continual prosperity, right? And so one of the things that we're building up in our community is understanding what does equitable investment and development look like in our neighborhood. Um, but one of the key pieces to understand in our community is that they have experienced a lot of harm with housing. A lot of them have been evicted. A lot of them have been bullied by landowners and their property owners. And so when we are meeting them where they're at, they have to go through a lot of healing processes when it comes to housing, and that we have to provide some type of mutual aid so that we can address the cri housing crisis that they're in. And then they have that personal connection and can see how they can give back and tell their story to advocate for greater resources in our community members. Uh, so that's been a, a really big journey for us is uh, providing trauma-informed care when it comes to housing and building their capacity of understanding the bigger picture of how do we advocate for more renter rights? How do we also uh, uh, be part of rezoning the housing element, all those things, so that there's equal investment in our neighborhoods to build more affordable housing uh, citywide. Um, but as you know, with NIMBYism, it's a very toxic space. And so how do we create a safe space for our community members to be involved and be uh, the leaders of implementing housing and planning in our city? Uh, so that's one of the things that we're doing in Long Beach is that we form together a Cambodian um, a Cambodia Town Thrives Collaborative to really help provide that base of organizing, but also uh, giving capacity building to our residents to understand planning and how the housing element works, how that affects the direct planning, and how what impact that they can have and what power they have to shift and implement housing in their own neighborhood. So I'm going to take a liberty and jump in. I mean, I, I think you're very eloquently speaking to the role of counselors as trusted advisors. Uh, I will share a very poignant story that I recently had. Uh, several of my team know this story, but I was at a housing counseling conference where I was speaking to a recent graduate of an HBCU. Uh, and uh, to his credit, he also recently became a homeowner and he went through the entire housing counseling and pre-purchase home ownership education experience. 
And the most powerful thing that he shared with me about his journey was how he never viewed home as a safe place. And I asked him why, because most people, you know, if you're, if you're in a safe and a healthy environment, home is your safe spot, right? And his story, he was an African-American gentleman, young professional. He, in fact, when he was approximately six or seven years old, his parents were foreclosed upon during the financial crisis. And he very, very strongly remembers the experience of moving in with his grandparents and how life changed then. Um, and so he never thought about home ownership as something, as we do, creating intergenerational wealth or allowing you to live near your workplace or near your faith-based system or whatever it may be, public transportation and so on. Um, he actually said he changed his mind when he had his trusted advisors and when he was in group education. And now he recognizing, recognizes being the owner of a new townhome that he's on a journey to financial success, the beginning of his career. And that's what this really is all about, right? The role of housing counselors. I, I think it's also uh, important to note that we are very focused on data in the Office of Housing Counseling. Um, with regard to our HBCU and MSI partnerships, we have a statement of work that is going to be collecting additional data beyond our 9902 reporting because those systems are quite candidly outdated and need to be updated. As well, in our new uh, home ownership initiative I was speaking about earlier, we will be collecting the data and we're also asking the Office of Policy Development and Research to issue a report based on the impact of our work. These are small but game-changing steps. Now, I'm also happy to report that we're in early stages uh, of looking at new systems at HUD. We're part of a, a larger effort across the housing office right now to modernize our systems. And we do that with really a, a, an, an eye towards really working with the high, entire housing counseling industry with regard to updating client management systems and how we engage with MISMO and all of the other initiatives that are out there. Because we have to document our success. And success can be the small things, for example, helping someone avoid an eviction through helping them get treasury assistance, or it could be a big thing it could be a, a young mother denied housing because she has too many children for the size of the unit, which is not based on any standard building code. It's just discrimination when it's said. So there are a lot of issues that we need to get, you know, really document our success and tell our story better on. And I think these are very, very significant. I know Paul had another issue, but before I go to Paul, does anyone else want to jump into the conversation? Sure. Tony? And, and, I just want to say, Ibi, yeah. you said yes? Oh, Paul, okay, go ahead, Tony. Oh, thank, thank you. I just wanted to say that uh, I think as you guys started the tribal uh, rule implementation, one of the big comments we heard was that uh, housing council is a small component of their larger housing programs. And I think uh, I probably thought that was fairly unique to tribes, but I think what I've heard from the panel is that almost all of these are kind of, you know, one-stop shops for housing and housing counseling is just a small component of what they do. So hearing some of the kind of trials and tribulations they've gone through and, and getting certification status probably makes me uh, and, ho and hopefully some of the tribal uh, audience out there a little bit more appreciative of the work that you guys are doing to accommodate, you know, what uh, what the tribal programs are doing. So thank you to, for, for all the work that you guys are doing in your communities. It's just very analogous to what I hear a lot from our tribal side. So I uh, appreciate that. And, and hopefully there's some more lessons that we learned uh, between the groups over time. Thanks. A core principle of our program has really been to give our agencies the deference and the respect to choose the area of focus that they would like to have with our program. You, you know, we have agencies that purely do landlord tenant. We have agencies that are focused on helping people move into rehabbed affordable housing in some of their communities. And of course, we have agencies that do a wide range of services as well. But despite, uh, I, I'm sensitive, I've, I've been a housing counselor since 1985. 
So I, I understand the grant challenges and the reporting challenges, but despite that, our program happens to be one of the most flexible as far as federal funding in the freedom that we give our agencies to really do what they feel is important for the clients they serve and the models they bring to bear. There's no one housing counseling model. Uh, Evie Joke. Sure. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge that in housing counseling, we're always having a conversation about are we doing quality counseling or volume counseling? Um, and so I, I think a lot of the conversation that you guys have presented today, um, where truthfully some agencies are serving under 30 clients a year, and, and then you have agencies that are serving thousands of clients. And most often than not, um, the volume organizations are not serving at scale the AAPI community. Um, and frankly, a lot of those um, organizations may not have the quality of counseling to have designated Hmong housing counselors or you know, providing the wraparound services that many of your organizations are doing to you know, increase uh, seniors' capacities to live um, or maintain uh, sustainable housing or even to um, have the innovation to hire two different staffers to be able to provide not only the language access uh, but also the technical capacity um, to provide counseling and, and resources to clients. Um, so one thing I just wanted to highlight, of course, is just really the importance for your stakeholders. Um, obviously, us as a committee and, and the groups that fund you, whether that be like federally or privately, and partners like Cal HFA to understand um, the story and the narrative. There, because there's, a, there's a unique storytelling ability that your organizations have for us to be able to understand the unique needs that are present in AAPI communities and frankly the need for flexible funding because we all talk about the rigidity in funding um, in housing counseling and, and, and some of the monotony of the processes I'm not going to look at David. <laughs> of the processes that exist that that that, that make it um, that make it challenging, and so I, I think that's something that's fair and, and that we hear and understand loud and clear. But probably less often, we don't necessarily hear the uniqueness of the stories um, and the way that you either structure your programs or the great lengths in which you have to. Um, create systems and structures to be able to serve the communities that you're directly interfacing with. I will say just calling out for a need for greater elevation of those stories so that there can be increased flexibility in terms of a funder's approach to how we support um, these services. But, but thank you for, for sharing and, and highlighting those models. What I'd like to say is uh, I know that Paul asked a question about the exam, but what I would ask you to do is to consider, because I know several other housing counseling agencies that have stepped out and done some of these things, and one of which was they really took that practice exam themselves. They divided it up themselves, and they, they piled and studied it in separate, con in separate ways. And uh, you are, from what I'm hearing from you, you are quite skilled enough to do that and put those things in place on, and then possibly come back to HUD and show us what you've done in essence so that we can you know, look at, the, at that because the financing and situations are not in place for it at this point in time, but you don't wait for that to happen. Train up your team in regards to it and then make them successful by the number of counselors you you, you create yourself. Are you all in this local area of Los, um, Los Angeles? No, no you're I'm in. not. <laughs> yeah. We're in LA County. Yeah. We, yeah. we serve LA County and Orange County. Yeah. But they're in Central Valley, California. Yeah. And I will say this to you, that there's that such thing known as Zoom. If you need to get together and work some things out, uh, you can do that. I do want to give a shout out to National Capacity. Christine Hikito is watching on Zoom right now, but she led a Zoom study group once a week for 
six months, I think, um, and every week going over a different topic. And so there were housing counselors from different AAPI serving organizations that all were studying for the exam, and so they all could be in this study group together. And that was a really beautiful social and collaborative way to prepare for the exam. Thank, thank you for that feedback. I'll share with you that our office is very interested in ensuring that anyone taking the exam feels comfortable and also will have choice as far as language with regard to the exam itself. I also made a commitment two years ago that we would be collecting demographic data moving forward. Again, things in government take time, but we are now beginning to collect that demographic data on pass rates and the impact of the exam. I will note, however, that the pass rates continue to go up the longer the exam has been in existence. And that's because it's become socialized now. And people are still saying those practice exams are the most beneficial aspect of preparing for the exam. Um, I, um, I want to, as we have to begin to wind down due to time, uh, Paul, I'll go to you. And I just want to check with Daniel, Angie, any, any thoughts right now? OK. Please. Yeah. No, one of the things that I was just going to quickly bring up, um, just having more resources for agencies to become HUD certified. We understand that, you know, housing counseling is important. It works. Um, and the more agencies we have that have HUD certified cou uh, counselors, the bigger of an impact we're going to have. So I think that's a discussion we should definitely have. And uh, I'm happy to report that our, at our regional meetings, we are actually having each second day a session bringing in uh, both HFAs or agencies interested in becoming HUD certified. Uh, and in Chicago, where we recently did this, the, the results were wonderful. We learned a lot. It was our first incubator, so to speak, for the new initiative. But there are more groups expressing interest in joining. The trend has been fewer agencies, all providing more services. The number of consumers counseled has not gone down, down nationwide, but the agencies that exist, the 1,500 plus agencies, are doing more. Now, that's also partially the result of matching funds as well, but I agree. Uh, Daniel, that's a very important conversation for us to be having, because uh, again, we want to be sure that not only consumers have a choice of who they can engage with, and whether that's in a mortar and brick environment, telephonically or virtually, but also that the offices are accessible at meeting the needs of a community. And so the way we're approaching it is, once again, we're gonna give great deference to the agencies we're funding to decide what is the best way to deliver HUD, uh, you know, high quality housing counseling services. And also we're taking a beginning to take a look at broadening what is the definition of what is HUD counseling as well, based on many of the points being raised here today. Our roles are evolving with the marketplace, no question. Uh, so that's part of the modernization discussions that we'll have in the future. Um, uh, Paul, let me turn to you. Thank you. Um, I, I saw a, uh, a quote um, a few days ago that I thought was very appropriate, and then I have one to follow up on uh, the comment about historical uh, black colleges and the work that that has been done to promote the program. But um, my quote disappeared real quickly. Let me bear with me for just, there it is. Um, and I, I think this relates to every person who's in the housing counseling field. And it's find a purpose to serve, not a lifestyle to live. And I think that's really very important for what, what we do. Um, I'm, I had a moment where I dusted off a 30-year-old, 31-year-old hat as a former academic dean. And um, California is blessed to have a truly exceptional community college system. And I didn't know if collectively um, there has been an effort to encourage um, the community colleges to offer a specific program to prepare housing counselors. Um, it may not be practical, it may be practical, 
but I like exploring ideas. And um, with such a wonderful community college system, that may be an opportunity to create a career path for individuals who um, may not be recent high school graduates, who may have an awful lot of life experiences who would like to enter the field. So I'm just tossing that out as a possible idea um, to help prepare more people uh, to serve more people. Thank you, David. Well, thank you for that. Thank you for that suggestion. In fact, that is something that is being discussed uh, in other parts of the country right now by our agencies. So it's a very good suggestion. Uh, Terry, you wanted to jump in? Sure. Just uh, I've heard a lot of really um, interesting and important insights today, particularly about our program and areas where we uh, can work with you to take another look. Um, I was particularly struck by the discussion of the differences in dealing with people culturally uh, and the length of time it takes to build a relationship. And yeah, that's true for the African American community too. And so it's not something that's just related to people, um, to the Asian American community. And it's obviously an area we have to take a longer look at. And it seems like um, given the comprehensiveness of the services all of you are providing, that this is a direction we would want to go in housing counseling. So that, that's one of the things I would, I would add. And then over the past two days, it's, it's been a really um, a great learning experience. And there's one thing I've taken away from the tour uh, yesterday, and it was this idea that in Little Tokyo, you, the community has come together to say that in focusing on our community, the things, the changes that are made have to be sustainable. And there were a couple of other values that were focused on preserving the community and preserving the culture. And I just feel like that you're really a leader in that area. Um, communities in cities all around the country are dealing with really rapid change. Um, black and brown communities are experiencing gentrification in many cities around the country. Lots of people are experiencing this displacement of housing. And so I think injecting that, er that quality of we need to preserve the culture of the community is a really important aspect that really hasn't been part of that housing conversation and maybe in the way that it should be. So I would just say um, I've learned a lot and it's just been a real pleasure. Thank you, Terry. And I want to acknowledge that our office is looking very seriously in future NOFAs with a greater understanding that it costs more to provide culturally relevant services. Uh, and we've already embraced that in our funding models, but you will see more uh, of these equity discussions as we approach future NOFAs, uh, some of which I've referenced today. Rosalind, I want to thank you and the entire panel. This was very informative. Thank you, all of you, for your guidance, how you prepared for this, I'll call it comment or briefing for us today. Uh, I know we all appreciate it on the advisory committee. We are going to next speak about the connection between housing counseling and some of the challenges of affordability in the community. Ladies and, and gentlemen, if, if everyone could go ahead and make their way back to their seat, we're gonna go ahead and get started again. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, sorry we ran a few minutes late, but the networking and discussion in the room was intense. I'm glad that everyone is reacting and wanting to follow up and discuss next steps. Uh, I am really delighted to introduce Andrew Chopra, who is going to lead us through our next conversation. Thank you so much. Um, this is going to be an important conversation. We've already heard this morning so many of the challenges that we face in the housing industry today. I mean, one of the most frequent challenges, apart from some of the issues we're talking about today, of course, is the increase in interest rates and how that's impacting affordability. Uh, you know, that's a home ownership issue, but yet it's also an issue when someone is in a need of a strong 
uh, loss mitigation solution if they are at risk for foreclosure. In escalating interest rates impacts on the ability to do forbearances and modifications and to sustain housing, let alone the available housing shortage, high rental costs, and so on. Uh, aging in place or having to downsize. We're hearing all of these issues, and in particular, where it's really resonating on how it's impacting on the AAPI community uh, really across the country right now. So Andrew, I'm, I'm sorry I'm setting up this conversation in such a challenging way, but thank you for your leadership in uh, orchestrating this panel, and let's get started. Great. Uh Thank you so much, Deputy, Deputy Assistant Secretary Berenbaum, um, and the entire uh, advisory committee uh, for you know, providing us this opportunity to talk to you about these important issues. Um, as uh, the Secretary mentioned, uh, the purpose of this panel is really to talk about um, some bigger picture issues when it comes to housing and community development. Um, and the needs of low-income AA and NHPI communities. Um, we were asked to have this panel because um, the housing counseling program said that there are times when they can really get caught into the, you know, the minutia of the housing counseling program itself and are, sometimes need to be reminded about what those housing challenges are um, that uh, communities face that you're actually trying to address. Um, so uh, we hope that this discussion will help inform your work going forward. Um, and bef I also did want to mention that we were supposed to have four panelists. Um, uh, Malcolm Young, the executive director of Chinatown CDC, actually had his um, flight canceled, uh, but he did actually go to the airport twice, <laughs> so we, uh, he gets an A for effort. Um, uh, but with that, um, I did want to pass it over to our other three panelists to just give them an opportunity to introduce themselves. Thank you. My name is John Wong, and Deputy Assistant Secretary Berenbaum, members of the advisory committee and audience and fellow panels, it's, it's an extreme honor to be here as a representative of the Asian Real Estate Association of America, ARIA. It's an association that's celebrating its 20th years. We're closing in on 18,000 members with 43 chapters around the country. The association is a business membership association. It is made up of real estate practitioners, mortgage professionals, and allied professions, architects, etc. But that's just the organization. The organization is made up of individuals who have deep, deep experience with some of the challenges faced by the AA and HPI community. Past presidents have been refugees from Vietnam, boat people who came and escaped at that time, had to be in assisted living for a number of years and kind of moved on that. And individuals, I, my parents uh, had the effects of the Chinese Exclusion Act, 18 years apart from my parents. And so it, it goes on and on. So while we are a business-focused association, it's within the perspective that it's just not the bottom line. And I think that put that in the context of some of the comments that I will make uh, later today. I will also say that the association recognizes, and it is a theme, is that we never forget some of the challenges that I mentioned our members and our leadership have faced, but we do our best to not get stuck in it, and instead look forward to solutions by becoming as strong business people as we can be so that we have the resources to influence some of the challenges that, that our forebears have faced. And I'm very excited to be here, thank you. Good afternoon, Deputy Secretary and members of the committee. I'm really honored to be here to talk to you and uh, get to meet you and get to know you through our tour yesterday and again today. My name is Sissy Trin. I'm the Executive Director of SICA, the Southeast Asian Community Alliance. And we do youth organizing and public policy around affordable housing um, in Chinatown and Northeast Los Angeles. Um, so this morning, I woke up to some really, really depressing news. I think 
some of you may know about the SCOTUS decision. Um, the other bit of news that kind of I, we woke, I woke up to this morning was the LA homelessness count numbers came out. And LA County saw an increase of 9% in homelessness, but Asian American homelessness actually more than doubled. And I think that the context of what we talked about yesterday and we continue to talk about today is really HUD's growing role in engaging in homelessness prevention. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's so nice to be with you here today. Um, I got to know some of you a little bit yesterday on the bus. My name is Panita Jansa. I'm the directing attorney at the Thai Community Development Center, and we're a community economic development nonprofit organization based here in Los Angeles. We provide community economic development through a series of strategies, including affordable housing development, small business counseling, and we provided HUD housing counseling for about five to six years, and I, I was formerly a certified HUD housing counselor as well. So I have a very deep knowledge of how these services are provided in this context, and I'm happy to be here to, you know, answer any questions and let you know what's going on the ground, going on on the ground right now with our community. Thanks. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, so with that, I just have two very basic questions for all three of you to answer. Um, the first one is, from your perspective, what are the greatest housing challenges that your communities face and why? Um, and second, what steps should HUD take to help AA and HPI communities address these challenges? Um, so why don't we just go down the row again? Uh, John, why don't we start with you? Well, a big theme that has been expressed today is disaggregation. In other words, understanding more deeply the components of the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander community. And part of the challenges that the community faces is that certain segments are doing really well. There's this crazy rich Asian perspective that kind of permeates our culture and the perception that anyone from the ANHPI community doesn't need help. And there's some evidence to explain why this is happening. I think the National Association of Realtors just released data that said that over the last 10 years, folks who have owned homes have had their equity increase by $100,000. It further breaks down that the middle income homeowners see, have seen their equity increase by 68% about $122,000, that low-income homeowners, those that earn less than 80% of the area median income, have seen their uh, equity increase by 98900 and that the upper-income group has increased by $200,000, by $150,000. They further break it down that when you have the uh, different segments of society, that over the past 10 years, the net worth of the white community has increased by $138,000, the black community by $113,000, the Hispanic community by $162,000, and the Asians have increased by $231,000. So broadly speaking, I can understand why communities do not understand that there is a deep need within parts of the A and HPI community. So ARIA, annually puts out a document called the State of Asia America Report. This was done a couple of years ago when the rise of Asian hate was But we began the disaggregation by regions. And kind of going through this year, we've deep dived, and it's something we're going to continue to do, where we actually disaggregate by different countries of origin. And I'll have uh, links to the digital versions of these documents to everyone. But let me give you, provide, share some uh, compelling information. So if you look at those who identified as Asian Indian population, about 4,400,000, average median income, 153,000, uh, home ownership rate about 62%. Chinese Americans about 4 million plus, 103,000 uh, income and 66.3%. And you break it down by the Filipino, the Vietnamese. The Vietnamese from this study, we found some interesting thing. Uh, population is about 1,800,000. 
Median incomes 82,900, significantly lower than the Chinese American and the Filipino Americans, but the ownership rate is higher, 69%. And anecdotal evidence, because I've lived through, I've been doing this for 40 years, it may be that when the Vietnamese community became ready for home ownership, that in fact the outreach to the communities in language about programs that are available to help for some was better received. Because that was that time where industry, whether it was a title company or a bank, they produced materials in various languages to reach. Those who have been here longer, like the Chinese and Japanese, may not have become been as aware of, the, of those type of programs. But if we further break down beyond those groups, the Native Hawaiian population, about 191,000 is, is what the data shows, um, median income of 78,000 and only 55% home ownership. And you go to the Burmese with just 46% ownership or the Nepalese, 198,000 population, but only 33% home ownership. So the ability to support and reach various communities about this. And I've mentioned home ownership. As I mentioned, many of the individuals that are active in the Asian Real Estate Association of America didn't come here as tech workers with big checks to buy a house right away. Many went through the process over time of working hard to save for it. And so the need to support individuals prior to the time that they need home counseling on financial awareness and how to buy is, is great. There needs to be a long-term understanding, and ARIA understands it is a continuum. You have folks right here who are the crazy rich Asians, but you have folks that need incredible support. And so we're actively reaching out and supporting the different associations. I'm very honored to be here with colleagues from the counseling agency. And I'll make a, a point that what has happened, and uh, the word toxicity, to toxic was mentioned earlier, talking about gentrification. I 100% agree. I will also note that I've been at this long enough that all of a sudden the conversations between housing providers, landlords, and housing users, tenants, has become very toxic. There's this perception that we're enemies. When in reality, historically, in this country, small property owners who may have purchased a two or three unit building so that the rent from the other units could help them with their mortgage, that's a traditional path for many of us to go into the middle class. And at that time, the relationship between the property owner and those who lived in the building was not like it is now. You know, that, and so I think that one of the things that's important for industry on, on my side to do is to do continue work on suggesting that we need to work together on solutions because what's happening now when we're sometimes adversarial is not getting good results. So I think those are, those are kind of the in parts that I think are important regarding maintaining ownership and supporting renters and knowing how to keep their homes is critical engaging the realtors who work with the housing providers is as critical, so there's a deeper understanding of how that conversation goes. Um, regarding counseling, one of the things that ARIA members observed during the Great Recession, when there was a big foreclosure crisis, was oftentimes the REOs, the real estate owned the foreclosed properties of individuals who had Asian surnames, when you walked in, they were spotless. They actually broom cleaned it before they left. And that wasn't always the case with foreclosure properties, but when the deeper dive, you reach into those borrowers, they had never, ever, ever contacted a bank. They were in trouble, but didn't realize that there were resources, counseling agencies and banks that you reached into to support them through that process. So one of the things that, as a practitioner, I think would be very important for counseling agencies to not just have the pre-housing counseling, not just have the rental support, but to really have a very engaged post-purchase process. Realtors know this, the first three years is when something goes wrong, what I do, and they'll often reach out to the realtor, I we had a health issue, my mom has cancer, what I do. The reality is realtors and ARIA members, who many of our realtors, 
are not as aware of the counseling support that can be provided. So I think that's a partnership that we need to expand because what we do is we keep folks who have worked very hard into their first home, help them maintain it for the first three or five years, the likelihood of success increases dramatically. And if you don't, and if you allow that to happen, then you're allowing the potential for generational uh, wealth transfer that will protect communities moving in the future. So I think the, the alliances and the connections that can be made um, from individuals in this room is really, really critical. So thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, I just want to quickly respond, if I may, to two points. Uh, uh, I fully concur with your recommendation that post-purchase counseling is critically important. And I'll just return to our new home ownership initiative, NOFA, that will be published so again, our community can become familiar with it before a grant application is issued. It will require pre and post purchase counseling for the very reasons that you uh, identified. Uh, as well, it is being uh, issued with a, a real effort to ensure that we realize and reach what I'll call first generation borrowers. Uh, but familiarity and a relationship with a housing counselor over the life of one's housing journey is something that we would like to really see across all the communities and constituents that we serve with our agencies. Uh, I also want to note uh, uh, something that the Office of Housing Counseling recently did. The members of the committee are aware of it because we briefed you about it previously. But that is, uh, we suggested to the Single Family and FHA Housing Office uh, there were a large number during the pandemic of FHA borrowers who were in danger of default, 60 days or more behind. For the very first time, the Office of Housing Counseling sent a letter to every borrower who was more than 60 days late so that they would receive what I'd describe as a friendly letter from the Office of Housing Counseling and not a letter that could be perceived as a debt collection. The response to that right party contact approach for the first year we did it, it was over 30% consumers immediately requesting a COVID forbearance. And so we need to think out of the box, as you're suggesting here, so that we establish meaningful partnerships with industry. Uh, many of our agencies had worked with servicers during the financial crisis. Some are also during it, have done it during the pandemic. But this was the first time that FHA, as an insurer, said, let's do this and support our agencies as well as our servicers. And it was win-win. And we did it a second time as well. And um, one of my takeaways is we did the original letter. It was a two-sided letter for budget reasons, but very, very simply presented so consumers would respond well to it. Uh, it was in English and Spanish, but one of my takeaways from our discussions today is obviously we need to do that in more languages, or at least have links available to the HUD website where it's available in multiple languages as well. But thank you for, you, for your comments. And if I make one closing, thank you so much for that. I think that from a practitioner, we recognize that that type of friendly reminder actually is very successful. And when we kind of core of why the disaggregation is needed, one is to have broader industry, government recognize that it's not monolithic. I've learned today we're not even decalithic uh, from the gentleman from earlier, but, but also it's reaching out to have our broad cross section of members of the ANHPI committee know that they can stand up and say something. There is a stereotype, but there's some evidence that it's accurate that there's a tendency for individuals who are immigrants from other countries to want to keep quiet, stay low. And I think that the work that the counseling agencies to reach is no, you have rights, you have a voice is critical. So it's really two prongs from both ends that the disaggregated data will help. So thank you. Thanks, John. Um, Sissy? So we don't do housing counseling. Um, part of the reason is, you know, a lot of housing counseling, the focus is on home ownership, and our folks are essentially too poor. They're on SSI, they're on TANF, they're on general relief. Um, but additionally, housing affordability, even subsidized programs, are becoming more and more out of reach. When we were in conversations with our local city planning department around our land use and zoning plan, we were negotiating around affordable housing incentives, right? And we were talking about for sale and rental. And the city planning department was very clear that they needed to include incentives for moderate and 
um, home ownership and workforce home ownership, which essentially is about 150 to 170 thousand dollars a year for a household. Um, the reason was because folks who make less than that can't get the financing together. You know, and this was like studies that they had done repeatedly, and it was just like, you know, it's true. Like our folks can't get the financing together, and even if they could, because SSI and TANF have those asset limits, you know. You, you have enough for a down payment, that means you get kicked off of your SSI, which means you get kicked off of your Medicaid and your food stamps, right? So there's just like all these disincentives for putting our people into home ownership. You know, the other thing too, anecdotally, like there's a number of like home ownership uh, buildings, uh, subsidized home ownership buildings in my neighborhood. They're going for $600,000 a unit. I can't afford that. I'm college educated, I'm an executive director, you know? And this isn't to say that home ownership shouldn't be a goal or an important part of HUD's work, but what I'm saying is that in hot market cities like LA, San Francisco, New York, Boston, it's becoming increasingly impossible. And I think that HUD has so much opportunity to get creative with the tools that it has. I think obviously we want more resources, right? More investment in 202, more investment in Section 8, but also how do we do it more strategically, right? You know, one of the things that we're kind of trying to figure out is one thing that I think we would love to see is prioritizing Section 8 vouchers to affordable housing developers, right? Like Little Tokyo Service Center that can cross subsidize for the units that aren't Section 8, right? So that we can get a deeper income targeting. You know, I said multiple times yesterday, our folks are too poor to qualify for affordable housing, right? There's a certain, like, operationally, you know, there's a, a certain minimum that developers have to meet before they go into the red, right? Now, so much of my work professionally and our organization's work is how do we get at that deeper subsidies? You know, we've done land use incentives, we've done local ballot measures, Locally, I think we're doing a lot to try and solve our homelessness crisis, right? We're self-taxing at rates of billions of dollars. You know, we're, we're actually like opening up 500 units a month of supportive housing for every month in LA, but it's not enough. And we do need that federal investment and that federal support. And I think that more resources, but also strategic deployment of resources, like, I would love to see, you know, an affordable housing development where, let's say you have 100 units of affordable housing, a handful of those can be Section 8 units that allow for more of the, like, 15% AMI units, right, to cross-subsidize so that the developer doesn't go into the red. Because this is going to be a growing issue as rents rise, because our rents, are, our incomes are stagnating. The fact is, you can work a minimum wage job in LA, and you're going to still be too poor to qualify for affordable housing. You know, and what we've been seeing with our members actually is a lot of our members have been choosing, you know, our members are high school students. They're choosing to fail their classes because they don't want to ask their parents for money for school supplies, right? So they're not, they're not like failing it because they don't care. It's because they have to do projects that require school supply, the purchase of school supplies, Right, and we're already starting to see a decline in enrollment and increase in dropout rates in LA Unified School District. A lot of that, according to the school district, is really driven by students who are dropping out to get jobs in order to pay for rent debt. You know, we, all, during the pandemic, spent an enormous amount of resources trying to get our families to apply for emergency rental assistance. And LA County and the state invested billions of dollars in rent forgiveness there were so many barriers that it just felt demoralizing. You know, half the time I was talking to my staff and we were like, why are we even trying? The state's emergency rental assistance program, they used Google Translate to translate their application. And in Chinese, it actually said, go back to your country. For our, our folks, you know, the applications were also all digital. We work with a lot of seniors who don't know what the internet is. Um, a lot of them, they don't get their mail at where they live because they can't read English, so it gets mailed somewhere else. So we had to get really creative about proof of residency, right? Like, we had to jump through all kinds of hoops. And even then, we got, I think, of all the applications we submitted, we got like a 90% denial rate. You know, and that was us intervening on behalf of these residents, right? Now, if we weren't there, we wouldn't, none of them would have 
actually submitted an application. Right? So we have all these programs to keep people housed. We have all these programs to help support people into financial stability. But unfortunately, it's not serving the most vulnerable, lowest income folks, folks who have limited English proficiency. And I feel like sometimes I just want to give up, to be quite honest. You know, it's really hard. But again, I think that HUD is at a place where you can get creative, right? Like I said, figuring out how to more strategically leverage the assets you have, maybe pushing some of the other federal agencies that have a hand in housing to get involved. Like, you know, our emergency rental assistance program is actually funded through FEMA, right? Again, trying to prioritize people who are at most risk for those funds, right? You know, we're working with our local transit agency, and you saw yesterday multiple projects that were right above transit stations, right? Getting the FTA to kind of loosen up some of their regs around land banking, for example. Obviously, you guys are HUD, not FEMA or Metro, but I think I'm just kind of giving examples of ways in which partnerships and alliances can really get a lot of win-win opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to share anything? Yes, I would. Please. Now, I'm just gonna circle back to the question a little bit because I believe it was regarding um, you know, greatest housing challenges that our communities are facing and why. And I have a few prepared remarks, but I also wanted to touch base on what happened to our communities during COVID and in the aftermath. Now, Los Angeles is actually the fourth most expensive city in the world to live in. And I'm just echoing the unaffordability of housing in, in LA. And the demand for affordable housing is far greater than the supply, as you know, we've, we've talked about today. Also, we need to look at the conversion of existing affordable housing stock into condos and market rate housing that additionally reduces that supply. And unaffordable housing causes a huge rent burden where people are paying 69% of income on their rent. In terms of solutions, I'd like to talk about the three Ps, the preservation of existing affordable housing stock, including rent control units, production of more affordable housing, and protection of tenant rights. At Thai CDC, um, we also focus on trying to prevent gentrification and displacement of our communities. And we've seen that start to happen in our very own Thai town that we had gone through yesterday. And we do this by organizing against catalytic real estate developments that bring in chain stores and market our luxury housing. Thai CDC organizes affected community members to voice their opposition at public hearings before city planning commission approving those developments. Developers hate opposition and will negotiate with the community as they want to avoid the delay in construction, which will make their projects more expensive. And I've talked to my executive director about this too, um, because at the location we visited yesterday at the Hollywood and Western Metro stop, we actually negotiated additional community spaces that would be open for our use um, in the affordable housing that was being developed on that site. Um, solutions also include agreements that run with the land and will ensure affordable housing when the property changes hands and also regulating the share housing platforms like Airbnbs to prevent illegal conversions of rent control buildings into micro hotels, displacing low income renters. So a lot of folks are being pushed out. Um, now, we also need to engage in more responsible land use and take out parking lots to build affordable multifamily housing, build affordable multifamily housing around transit, develop more mixed-use projects with retail and commercial on the bottom and housing on the top. And, you know, this, this need would increase density, but LA, unfortunately, 
Um, there are a lot of NIMBYs, not in my backyard people, who don't want the congestion, traffic, lack of parking, and blocking of their views. That's why it should be done around transit to mitigate these negative impacts and create a more equitable transit-oriented community. Otherwise, these NIMBYs will see more homeless and encampments, so, you know, so forget their nice views and what they perceive as negative impacts such as traffic and lack of parking. Now, that all being said, Thai CDC is a, an affordable housing developer, and we partner with Little Tokyo Service Center and other organizations to ensure that there, there is more housing, but we, we simply just can't do enough. During the COVID pandemic, um, we actually switched our focus um, to alleviate some of the trouble that our communities who are renters are facing. Um, we actually started representing renters that were in the eviction process. However, because of the demographics of our community, many folks actually didn't have a formal lease agreement. And these may be undocumented folks, maybe folks who shy away from uh, formal, the formal legalized um, lease agreements that are available uh, for a lot of different reasons. You know, maybe they're a little bit more um, unstable due to their, their jobs or you know, their, their status as low wage workers. And we found it very difficult to assist with rent relief programs that were available locally and statewide, um, just because we would have to prove a lot of things, including you know, bringing out these rental agreements that just didn't exist. And so we're kind of um, trying to help a population that is very much in limbo. Um, and though we would like to provide them with assist, you know, additional um, housing counseling in terms of rental counseling, it's not the same framework, right? So these are folks who, you know, we want to help on their path to legalization, as well as understanding, you know, if they can get a lease agreement, they can up assert their rights as renters. So, you know, even in um, situations where they are legal permanent residents, um, they, because they lack the language and sophistication, you know, they'll just go with a co-ethnic uh, homeowner that is renting out a room, but also very easily harasses them and kicks them out when, when their needs change. Thanks. Thank you, thank you very much. <clears throat> Um, I want to ask the members of the committee if they would like to uh, respond in any way or ask any questions. And that includes our online members. Okay. I want to thank the panel. This has been very informative and often the big picture is equally challenging as working with our consumers because of how it limits affordable housing choice or options. I, I do, Sissy, if I may, want to respond to one point you made and uh, totally respect that you felt the housing counseling program was sort of not the right fit. But I, I just want uh, anyone in our viewing audience to understand that our office provides complete choice to any agency as to the nature of services that an organization provides. We have organizations that work exclusively in the landlord-tenant space. We have organizations that work exclusively with elders, often with reverse mortgage involved as well. So, so there's a wide range of approaches uh, as well as program offerings by our agencies. And again, what we want agencies to do is meet the needs of the community they serve. Um, there is no, while of course HUD is focused on bridging the home ownership gap, our program really defers to the needs on a local level or national level for our intermediaries. So I just wanted to share that. So I just want to be clear, this is not a critique of the housing counseling program or the work that happens at all. I'll give you an example. Um, we are, there's a homeowner in Chinatown. His grandparents bought the property many, many years ago. It's a multifamily building and he has since inherited it. Um, he, can't afford to maintain the building, but he's not raising the rents because he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to renovate the building because he doesn't want to raise the rents on the tenants, right? So no matter how much housing counseling you provide to him or to the tenants, the fact is that there is a subsidy gap 
that counseling cannot provide. So it is not about a critique of the value of housing counseling. I, as a beneficiary, I highly believe it. It's more about just kind of there the are bigger systemic issues around affordability and the gap between rents and income in LA that housing counseling will not be able to provide in the context that we work. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I'm a firm believer that not-for-profit organizations need to be a voice for their constituency, and we used the word advocacy earlier today in our conversation. There are many and multiple roles for not-for-profit organizations in representing their communities. So thank you each for what you're doing. Thank you for what area is doing as well, some good counsel and guidance for opportunities for partnering. And we need, unfortunately, to move on the agenda. So uh, we're going to move to what I'll describe as our informal wrap up. Please stay seated there if you'd like. Um, so I want to first once again express our appreciation to National Capacity and to everyone who was part of our discussion today. Uh, John, I know that uh, Paul Yorkus suggested your participation. I want to express my appreciation to Paul for your presence today as well. Um, this, and I'd like to invite all of the members of the committee, but I'll start with Angie, just to share their thoughts. And if you have any immediate thoughts as far as the next step, feel free to suggest that too. Before we go to the public session of our meeting. But Angie, please jump in. Sure. So, um, you know, the, the these panels today, as well as the uh, in-depth uh, bus tour um, that we had yesterday, and thank you so much to uh, CC, um, Hanita, and so many of the um, other uh, local um, LA area um, community organizations for hosting us um, and for taking the time. Um, to share your stories um, and the particular struggles in your communities and also all the way from Hawaii. Um, I, I think um, for, for myself, um, you know, in terms of the, the organization that I represent, um, you know, uh, it, it resonates a lot. Uh, many of our work is also um, very uh, comprehensive, community-based. So whether it's rental, uh, home ownership, affordable housing development, youth development, um, it's all tied together. And so, you know, I, I've been on this um, HUD advisory council for I think a little over a year. And um, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to community members. But I think um, the greatest takeaway um, for, for me uh, wearing this hat of the advisory council is while I know that within HUD there are many different offices, some are focused on multifamily, um, some are on fair housing, and this is on Office of Housing Counseling. But I think what we've heard over and over again is that so many times the communities that we serve, they're not experiencing those as um, issues, um, you know, um, existing in separate vacuums that they're all intertwined. We know that there are people in our communities, maybe they work in restaurants or hospitality, that their incomes are just too low. They're never going to be ready to you know, be able to become homeowners. Um, and so I really um, appreciate uh, this meeting um, in tying those issues together. And what I would like to see, loved for HUD is to think about, um, you know, how to better incorporate those issues, the rental and the homeownership side. Thank you. I think describing HUD as having multiple cylinders, as some people do, is a fair statement. But I will share with you that Secretary Fudge and Dep Deputy Secretary Todman are very much about breaking down those cylinders so we all work very cohesively together. And I will say one of the strengths of the Office of Housing Counseling is that often we have been um, a leader in community engagement through our partnerships with the Housing Counseling and Legal Service and other communities. 
And that's something I hope we can continue to build upon. And it's one of the reasons our team always says, if you have an issue that involves multifamily or another branch of HUD, another division of HUD, and you're having a challenge, reach out to us so that we can help facilitate a discussion or a resolution of the problem. But the point is very, very well taken. Um, I just uh, also wanted to note uh, you know, that we're very sensitive that we have a greater responsibility to ensure that every American has a place where they can live safely and affordably. And it went so deep into our thinking that even our national campaign, it doesn't say let's make home ownership the goal. It says let's make home the goal. And that was very pointed on our part. We're very sensitive to the issues that you're raising and we're committed to that bottom line. I'd like to invite other members of the committee to jump in. Anyone else? Paul? I, I just want to, um, th th these two days have been remarkable. So I, I thank everybody who, who helped plan it and implement it. Um, but I wanted to share a couple of things. In Massachusetts, um, the law says that um, an agency disclosure form, a home inspection advisory form, and a, a lead paint form uh, needs to be presented to every consumer. Um, and that's been the law. Um, I'm delighted to share that two of those three forms uh, are now available uh, in seven different languages in Massachusetts and the, the lead paint form um, should be available, but isn't because it has to be approved by the U.S. Department of Environmental Protection because they regulate that form, uh, but that too will soon be available f in seven different languages. So those people who are listening, viewing today, um, please encourage your states to do that so that we're in a much more equitable situation to serve everybody who's interested in being a homeowner or a tenant um, in, in their community. Um, I just, I, I think there are things that can be done that are small uh, and those forms are relatively small, but they're very important in terms of providing equity um, to people who do not have English as a primary language, so. I'd like to offer our members who are participating online the opportunity to comment. Uh, please feel free to turn your camera on and uh, again, just give the team a moment to, to raise your mic. Is Richard's mic raised? Okay, you're good to go. Yeah. He, uh, speaking, we're not hearing. He's saying he can't. They're saying you may be muted. Can you hear me? I, I keep losing everyone, I'm sorry. Um, sorry I couldn't be there in person. I, I feel like I, I missed out a lot. Uh, my, my appendix going out went out at the wrong time. So I wish I could be there with you guys. But I think for me, this was just eye opening um, to, to the issues that um, the, the Asian population faces. Um, to me, it's hearing all of this. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we were able to focus on, uh, on this and, and shed some light on the issues they face. And I think there's a lot more conversations for us to have uh, around these issues. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Richard. Yeah. Uh, would anyone else uh, like to participate and join? David, I would have. Uh, sure, I just, just want to give our online members an opportunity. Anyone else? Okay, Ibi Joke, go ahead. Sure. Um, I wanted to just uh, acknowledge um, really what has been robust conversation around and elevation around uh, homelessness, specifically in LA. Um, and I, I think we acknowledge in a number of meetings um, how, just in the counseling community, 
um, whether longtime counselors have left and have left with a lot of knowledge and you know, have either previously been really focused on foreclosure counseling and have now moved to focus on, on um, pre-purchase counseling. And we are very much so in an environment that is emphasizing home ownership because it is significantly gapped. Um, but I just wanted to acknowledge that um, it's impossible not to hear your point loud and clear on the homelessness, <laughs> on the homelessness side of things. Um, and obviously, even through yesterday's tour and just our time here in LA, not to see it. Um, but I also toss that challenge back out to you. Um, as LA is obviously leading at some of these historic uh, figures in terms of the rate of, of homelessness. I think you guys said it increased by 9%. It has du doubled for the Asian community in the last year or so. I think this provides a really unique opportunity for the field to sort of learn um, what some of the best practices may be from service providers in this community in terms of homelessness intervention and the rental counseling that counselors throughout across the country are very much so still learning or relearning just because of the changes in the market. Um, and then the second thing I wanted to even just highlight and, and really thank all of you for mentioning for us again is and I know many of us have talked about it today, is that building trust theme. Um, we are very much so, um, someone mentioned yesterday during the tour that the AAPI community, and I think it might have been you, Sissy, that said um, was one of the first hit in terms of COVID-19, in terms of the business owners needing to shut down, obviously because of a lot of the xenophobia around how COVID developed. And so just thinking about the impact of that, thinking about um, our building trust in the communities, and even if we look throughout the pandemic, the rate in which communities were, were or were not getting vaccinated because of building community trust. I mean, I think there's so many themes that have been highlighted in terms of the way in which our clients access services that are much needed within their, in, in their communities because of the lack of establishment of building trust. And so I, I think it's just a reminder and a challenge for us all as service providers in this space, whether that be um, connected to the entire pathway of housing, whether that is for extremely low income consumers, uh, low income persons, moderate folks that are in homelessness seeking stable renting, or seniors, folks pursuing home ownership that as stakeholders, uh, federally, privately, and again, nonprofit service providers, we've got a great responsibility to helping to establish trust within our respective fields and obviously across the communities that we serve. And so I just wanted to thank the panel for really highlighting um, those themes for us today. Thank you, please. I also want to echo the thank yous. This has been really, really educational, and um, I really appreciate not only the information, but the work that everybody does every day in the communities. And um, I, I feel very um, humbled by, by, wow, just all the work that everyone's doing. Um, in terms of uh, some of the things that you said, obviously resources are short, so being a representative from the mortgage industry, but also always being in the finance industry, I'm always figuring, trying to figure out ways for money. And um, so, you know, some of the things that we were looking at in New York um, in terms of helping some of the groups that were falling short, but also I think would, would translate, looking at who, who are people that have similar uh, challenges so one of the things you mentioned was the trust building and that there's a cost involved and a lot of time involved in that. So, um, and, and with good reason in terms of the trust of the government programs and things like that with these populations, who else is sharing a similar challenges, banks that are trying to now go into unbanked and underbanked communities and build trust, which doesn't exist for good reason in that space as well. So they, they are trying to build bridges and build relationships and they're trying to start student banking. Like they're looking at all the same things that you were mentioning. You have to get to them before they are at a point where they need to be home ownership ready. You have to get to them so that they understand in households where banking consists of going to cash your paycheck on Friday at the corner 
um, and there's not really any kind of depository or credit score considerations or anything. Um, how do we how do we get into those communities? And so there's money in banks that maybe if we're looking to partner or work together um, to come up with a way uh, to build trust and forge relationships that we could join forces um, or even that they could um, contract out or, or work with you or support your efforts in that space. Um, I think that uh, financial literacy has a similar kind of track. Um, trying to get financial literacy as an ingrained part of the curriculum all the way through school, um, opportunities to maybe de develop curricula and teach courses at community colleges on financial literacy to help people um, getting into that. Um, workforce development in two in two different spaces. One, obviously, in the housing industry, there you know there are people that that do well in real estate and mortgage finance and and things like that, and it would be very beneficial to people trying to obtain their homeownership dreams to have people working with them that look like them, that understand their cultural um, their cultural challenges and the things that are unique to their communities. Um, but then also on the flip side, um, skilled labor workforce development that could help with the housing labor sh uh, the housing labor shortage and help us make construction of new housing and preservation of existing housing more affordable. Um, <clears throat> and then the last thing that I would say is from an advocacy perspective, I think we all have an obligation since um, housing counseling is working so closely now with um, single family and other, to advocate for program guideline changes that address cultural differences, things like intergenerational households where, you know, it's not a lease where you could say, I get a check for $600 every month from my uncle because they're contributing towards the groceries or they're contributing towards, so it's not a formal transfer of funds every month, but to be able to look at maybe bank statements or cash flows or something to be able to allow that income to be counted or other types of ways to be sensitive to cultural differences um, in guideline changes, I think could also really help with access um, in some of these communities. Thank you. Unfortunately, we are running short on time and we do need to move forward to our public comments period. <laughs> what I would like to share though, besides my appreciation, is that I want to keep this line of communication open. And I invite all of our participants and everyone in the viewing audience who is engaged and providing services in the AAPI community if you have not had the opportunity to engage with the Office of Housing Counseling, please do, because we're very responsive and we're interested in your thoughts. And in particular, to the point of taking a fresh look at how we deliver services that particularly is culturally pertinent and relevant, we're very open to your suggestions right now. Because again, the issues are evolving. The issues continue to be very challenging working with our consumers, and we need to evolve are how we practice housing counseling to meet our consumer where they are approaching us from. So thank you all. Uh, I am gonna turn the meeting now over to Virginia Holman, who is seated to my right. Virginia is our designated federal official, and she will explain the comment, public comment process. Okay, thank you very much, David. And could I have the slide? <coughs> There we go. Um, as David said, this is a very important part of our meeting where we ask the public to give us comments um, relative to what we discussed or just any other housing counseling topic. Um, just to give you a little bit of guidance on how the process is going to work, um, you're gonna be able to make your comments either through Zoom or in person. Um, using the Zoom link, um, the facilitator will call on you if you registered to speak or in response to that fancy raised hand in Zoom. Um, the facilitator will open your line, but then you must unmute your, your microphone yourself. But then you're also going to be able to make comments in person um, if you registered um, again, the facilitator will call on you, but if you didn't register, you still have the opportunity to speak. 
Um, you just need to go to the microphone, um, and we're using the microphones at this table where our panelists have sat. Um, a staff member, the facilitator, will be able to help you, and we'll call on you to, when it's your turn to speak. We'd like you to just introduce yourself by providing your name and your organization if you want to. An important thing that there is a two-minute limit on your individual comments, and we will be monitoring that. So you need, as I said earlier, restrict your comments to the topics that we discussed today or just general housing counseling issues. Another important fact is the, the members of the advisory committee will not respond to your comments or questions during the meeting. Um, they will, however, consider them at a later date during uh, future deliberations. So um, at this point, we will have um, the facilitator start. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, first, um, in person, we have Latrice Moore. I believe Latrice has left. And next on the list, we had Eric Nanano. Okay. He's also left. Um, right now, we have Ann Molina and also Rosa Coronado. So we did not have anybody on Zoom? Right now, no hands are raised, and the ones that were scheduled, um, they're no longer online. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you so much for allowing us to participate. This has been one of the best conferences in my whole housing career. It was amazing to hear from all of you. Um, to the housing counseling agencies, don't give up. We have to keep going. I do want to just mention that I, I have low vision. And when I took the housing counseling test, uh, I want to explain, I've been a housing counselor for 12 years. I've been a banker for 12 years. So I felt very prepared to take the test after taking the practice exam. But one of the requirements, if you have low vision, if you need any kind of accommodation for the screen size or for the test taking time, is to apply 30 days prior to test taking. I began working at my organization on April 18th. I scheduled my test for the next week, so I couldn't get the accommodation. I think that if we can maybe lower that window, that would help for those that are not um, primarily English speakers to have an extended time and not have that 30-day window out. The second thing is that you're not allowed to use a pencil and paper to do the math problems. And any housing counselor that's done it for more than a week knows that they need to take out a pen and paper and write out a budget. So I think it'd be very helpful, and I don't think that that would change the cost or make anything um, more difficult on the test. It would also lower the pressure of somebody who's trying to get a job as a housing counselor. Uh, the second thing I wanted to mention is that in LA, you have to make 72,000 to be able to afford a one bedroom. Most housing counselors make less than 60,000. So when we're talking about trying to get young people to go into housing counseling as um, their, their education path, we also have to think that we are gonna be putting them into debt. Because in Los Angeles, if you make under 70,000, you qualify for the down payment assistance as a low income a homeowner. So the, you know, we're, we're teaching um, financial literacy when we're all struggling as well. So that was my comment. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts. Please. Hi, uh, Rosa Coronado. I'm here on behalf of East LA Community Corporation. Uh, my comment is in regards to language justice. Um, as an organization, we stand for offering services or information in the language that people are most comfortable in. Then that cost, it, that cost is something that we do have to um, put up with, right? So for example, um, we hosted an Affordable Housing 101 workshop to give information as to how to apply. Um, it was an, a one hour workshop via Zoom. Interpretation is $100 an hour but the minimum requirement is two hours. So we covered a $200 bill 
for a one-hour workshop, um, not necessarily being funded, the work that we're doing, and so that's one of the issues. Um, so in terms of HUD's budget, it would be beneficial to allocate funds to cover the high translation costs. Um, a lot of, I wanna bring attention to grassroots leadership and organizations and community organizers that play an imperative role in providing ideas and education in alternative housing. So there are, um, in the east side, we have the Fidecomiso Tierra Libre. They are a grassroots organizing organization. Um, they've been working to, you know, acquire land or provide um, or start talking about cooperative housing since we know that the housing crisis is not going anywhere. And so definitely thinking of these alternative housing models and figure out ways to finance them because financing them has been very difficult. Thank you, wow. Both very pointed comments and we appreciate the information and recommendations shared with us. Do we have any other commenters? No, that is all the comments for today. All right, thank you I'm very sorry. much. Oh, ah, I'm sorry, please. we have another. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, you come on. Welcome, sir, please. Oh, thank you. Hi, my name is King Chung. Uh, I'm gonna group called the Chinatown Community for Equitable Development. And um, in the last two years or so, the, uh, we have been involved with a um, section 202 uh, Kathleen Manor Senior Citizen Housing. And uh, it's been put up for sale. And the funny thing is that um, the buyers, they're asking for a lot of money, the maximum allowable rent, even more than what uh, the luxury market rate housing are asking in the neighborhood, such as Ja, Blossom Plaza, Arts, Pro Arts Plaza, or Orsini. The first uh, buyer want to raise around the 2750, uh, which is quite a bit, and I'm glad the HUD turned it down. Uh, the second one want to um, raise it to uh, 2540, which is pending right now. And I just want to make sure that HUD does not waste our taxpayer money, being too generous with our, with our money. Um, you know, the money is, is tight and the needs are, are great, and we should use the, the money prudently. And, um, you know, if we, if we allow, if HUD allowed this kind of uh, maximum allowable rent increases, then it would gentrify the area. From what I've seen is that um, LA City, they allow, on Section 8, allow only about $2,094 a month in rent. And then for, I guess, HUD guideline for 9012 area is $1,900 some dollars. And I, I don't see how, why this um, uh, developer acting for so much. Uh, we just want to be fair and equitable and nothing more. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Do we have anyone else in the room who would like to make a comment? All right. Well, thank you to all of our commenters, and we will reflect on what has been shared with us. I want to thank the members of the committee for the time and effort that you have put into uh, what was a very intense two days, and as well for some of the challenges with airline travel to arrive here. Thank you for all of your efforts. I know a number of you came in very late. Um, as we're moving forward, I will share with you that our next meeting that we're planning will be a virtual meeting. Uh, we will also be looking to schedule it, it looks like in September, probably during the week of our National Virtual Community Conference. Actually, it's 9-11. This is scheduled for it. 9-11? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, scary. <clears throat> well, we'll, we'll talk more about the scheduling uh, of, of the event. But uh, in any case, it will be in September. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure I, I think we should do it on 9 11 for various reasons. But, uh, yeah. but we'll talk about that. We, that can be a side conversation. 
But I do want to thank everyone, as well as, once again, all of the groups, all of the professionals who we met with. Um, I really believe that this two-day meeting lived up to all of our hopes and expectations to really engage with a very important constituency in the population that we serve. And I'd be very interested to hear your informal thoughts away from the meeting uh, about should we replicate this, perhaps with other groups, maybe the Latino community or others. I think it will be very rewarding if we will consider doing that. But more importantly, once again, as we conclude today, I do invite all of our groups who are interested in the issues we spoke about today to stay in contact with myself, with the directors in our offices, with your points of contact at the HUD Office of Housing Counseling. We are here to help. Thank you, everyone. We are adjourned.